Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to start today's class, which is the first in an introduction to model of uh, epidemic dynamics. What we are going to cover today is a very brief and high-level introduction to using um, differential equations to try to understand how disease will spread in a population. So the general uh, framework of disease modeling is that we want a series of compartments that are going to represent the different states of a population. So we can sort of draw a diagram of what the uh, population is going to look like. And we are going to start with a very simple model where um, individuals start as being susceptible and they can become infected. All we need to do, quote unquote, to transform this thing into a model is to define what happens when we, uh, when we move from being a susceptible um, individual to being an infectious individual. So this is a process that we need to represent using some sort of mathematical formalism. Now we're going to say that this process is going to say, oh, to be 2i. Um, the, the process that we are going to use is infection. And we are going to say that infection happens at a rate that we are going to call beta. Why beta? Um, purely by tradition, in a sense. The, the modeling of epidemics has a very long mathematical history that dates back to the beginning of the 19th century. Um, and it just so happened that people have been using beta as a variable for um, the rate of infection. Or they've been using beta for some quantities that are related to but are not quite the rate of infection. The first chapter of any epidemiological modeling textbook is usually a very long discussion of why the other side of the, of the, um, the debate is, uh, is wrong. We're going to say that beta is, um, is a rate of infection and we're going to see how that translates into uh, the behavior of the model. So, by doing that, we have defined a model conceptually, right? There's individuals that are susceptible. Whenever an individual that is susceptible is going to encounter an individual that is infectious, uh, within a single unit of time, there is a quantity, beta, that is going to determine the risk of the susceptible individual becoming itself infectious. And that's it. That is a full model. Now, what is interesting with this model is that we can start making a few, um, we can start making a few uh, notation. We know that what is the, the change in uh, in s ds? Well, ds is going to be uh, minus. We are losing susceptible individuals that are becoming um, infectious at a rate that is beta, and that depends on the number of contacts between infectious and susceptible individuals. We also know that uh, these individuals that are removed from the pool of susceptible individuals, they are going to become infectious. And so we can put them directly into DI, which is a change in the rate of uh, infectious people. So what we know is that DS uh, is equal to minus DI, and so that translates into uh, ds plus dy is equal to zero. Which is not to say that there is no change in the system. It's just that the change in one direction is compensated exactly by the change in the other direction. So we lose uh, the number of individuals that are susceptible that we lose to infection are going to be the exact same number of infectious people that we gain through the infection process. That has a very important consequence. The very important consequence that it has is that because um, the change of S and the change of I cancel one another at any time, we can say that S uh, of T plus I of T is going to be equal to a constant N of T. Something that remains constant um, in a model over time that is a function of the variable is what we uh, usually refer to as a constant of motion or a constant of movement in the system. So 
what is the biological meaning of that? The biological meaning of that is uh, it's actually an assumption, a very important assumption that we're making. And this very important assumption is the population size is going to remain the same over time. We are going to see changes in the relative proportion of individuals that are infected or infectious or susceptible. But the total number of individuals in the population is going to remain the same. That is an important assumption because it is uh, it's saying two things. First, that we are going uh, for the moment to ignore any sort of demographic dynamics. Uh, and that we are also going to assume that there is no mortality associated to the disease. So the first model that we're designing here, it's something that is um, short, something that goes really fast because it goes faster than the rates of um, the demographic process in the population. That's why we can remove them. Uh, and it's also entirely benign. It's not creating any additional mortality. So it's just something that gets transmitted from people to other people, but then it, it doesn't um, change anything. This is the most simple example of a, um, of a, a, a disease transmission process. And what is interesting that we will use that as a, the first brick in a much more complex edifice that we will be building. So it, it sounds like a growth oversimplification. It is, in a sense, but it's also something that we can, um, we, can, we can use to build things that are more complex. Even though it sounds like an oversimplification, it does have some real-world equivalent. And one of these equivalents is um, if you have a class of school children and one of them has a cold, and then suddenly they all catch this cold, uh, there is no demography, there is no, uh, there is no adverse effects of that besides the fact that they all have a runny nose for a week. That is a, um, an, I, an, an example of a disease that can be represented by the SI model. No, I'm talking about real-world application here, but I want to qualify that uh, quite a lot, especially because uh, due to, you know, everything that is going on at the moment, uh, a lot of people have been making models of epidemics. I've been making models of COVID. They've been criticizing models of COVID. People who have no formal introduction to mathematical epidemiology have been going on long tangents, uh, very long Excel spreadsheets about, you know, epidemic parameters and, and time series dynamics and all that. Um, what is interesting is that if you pick a textbook, like an actual textbook of modeling uh, infectious disease. Let's, let's pick two examples that were just lying randomly around my uh, kitchen table for some reason. Um, this one, Aviniki and White, or this one, Killing and Rohani. The first chapter of both these textbooks, which are pretty good by the way, uh, is going to tell you the point of making a mathematical model of a disease is not to understand one specific disease usually, the way we do it, the way it's covered in this textbook, the way we're doing that in the class. The point of this model is to understand the biology behind the infection, pro the infection process. It is to understand contagion over time, over space, over age classes, and we can take inspiration from biological systems in building these models, but what we cannot do, we take these simple models and get back to the real world and say, this is what you should do. The model that people use to do actual forecast of epidemics are several orders of magnitude more complicated than that because they have to address the contingencies of the real world. So don't, don't expect that we will uh, say anything of applied or practical relevance here. We are doing modeling, we're doing biomathematics, we are not uh, doing real world forecasting or, or any of that. We'll, we'll, we'll use some empirical data we'll discuss what this can mean for the empirical system, but this is theory. It's a theoretical exercise, which is fine. It has value in and of itself. It doesn't need to be more than, uh, than that. I'm uh, done with my very long rant about uh, why people should not talk about models. Right, so uh, let's, let's write this model down using code this time. So we are going to use three uh, packages to do that. Uh, we're going to use plots because we want to visualize the output of what we do. 
Uh, and we are going to use the uh, combination of uh, diff egg biological, which um, is a something on top of differential equation. It's like a DLC for differential equations. Um, what defect biological does is that it offers access to something which is called which we call a DSL. DSL stands for domain specific language and it's a way of noting some problems for uh, specific areas of application that are easier to write than the actual code. So if you remember the very last class we had two weeks ago, uh, we wrote down the equation for the Lotka Volterra Pre system. And we had to say, okay, text this variable from this position in the vector, put it at this position in the vector of derivative, extract this parameter from that and that and that. And it was, it was manageable because the model was simple, but sometimes we want something that is a little bit more um, intuitive shall we say and and defect biological is offering that and and so much more there's um there's a rich documentation that you should be looking at it offers the ability to render the model that you write as mathematical equations and that is something that is fantastic um sort of abolishing the difference between what is a code and what is a mathematics uh, but for the moment we're going to just use it to solve uh, to write the uh, differential equation systems by uh, by itself so uh, we are going to define the uh, SI model. So SI stands for susceptible infectious. It's a model in which we have two steps where you can be susceptible or you can be infectious. Models of epidemics that are based on compartments, the one we're going to discuss in the next three weeks, uh, they have a very standard notation. So S is susceptible, I is infectious. There's a bunch of other letters that we're going to add on top of that. And the order of the letters, that's very neat, is the order of the infection process. So a model that is SI means that you start susceptible and then you end up infectious. To write this model as a uh, reaction network, we just say SI is equal to a reaction network. And then we begin the reaction network. The syntax here, um, there's a few there's a few different ways to write all of that right but it's uh what is the rate of reaction what are the ingredient that you put in the reaction and what is the product of the reaction so what is interesting is that this is a very direct parallel of something that would be a chemical reaction what are the two um i was really bad at chemistry so i don't know any of the fancy word that I should be using, but the two things that you put, what is the rate that we did transform into another third thing? Uh, and that's the same thing that we're doing here. We are putting two things together, so someone who is susceptible and someone who is infectious. And that is going to give us two people that are infectious, but not all the time. It's going to give us that at a rate which is beta. Uh, and then the model is over and we write the different parameters of the model. So we can run that and uh, that is going to give us a function that we can use as a, uh, as a model. So the rest of the, the work here is to do the same thing that we've been doing so far when we were working with the um, differential equations package, which is to give value to the parameters. I'm going to say that uh, beta is equal to uh, 2 to the minus 2, 2 times 10 to the minus 2. That's like a, that's a good question. What does it mean? It's 2%. What, what does 2% mean? It means that per unit of time and per contact, there's about a 2% chance of these individuals, uh, of one infectious individual resulting in an infection of a susceptible individual. We're making a really big assumption that we will get to revisit maybe six this week depending on how it goes definitely next week because i think it's an important one but for the moment we put two people together and within a unit of time and a contact there's a two percent chance that this contact will result in infection the next thing that we want to do is to set the size of the population right and we start with two we have two compartments so we have two sides the size the first size is the number of susceptible people initially 
Uh, the second size is the number of uh, infectious people initially. We're going to start with a population that has a thousand individuals. Like it's a small, um, a small city, a large village, if you will. Uh, that has a thousand individual, and one of these individuals is going to be uh, infectious at the beginning of the simulation. And we are going to simulate that from T0 to T40. What is 40? It's the maximum time expressed in the unit of times of our model at which we want to see, um, as we want to stop the simulation. Time points uh, is just something that we will use to uh, ask the model to save every one time step. For the moment, we'll just call that time steps, units of time. Not try to qualify that more, uh, but we will do the we'll change this in a minute. So uh, let's let's do the problem. The problem that we want to solve is an uh, sorry, it's an ODE problem that is specified by uh, the SI system that has uh, U note uh, parameters at the beginning, U note individuals at the beginning that we want to simulate from uh, 0 to 40, and then the parameters are stored in P. So let's check. That's an audio problem with U type, it's an array of integer numbers. T type is a floating point number for time. Um, we can see that it's going to be done in place. Remember that uh, two weeks ago, we, we said that it's important for um, performance reason to keep one array of derivatives and rewrite it. That's like in place allocation. Uh, reaction networks is uh, going to do that automatically for us. So it's taking care of the um, some of the inner workings of the model. It's, it's making decision for us. And that's a good thing because like our little smooth monkey brain that's floating in our skull is not always necessarily making the best decision for ourselves. And so we want to trust the package to take good decision for a problem. The second decision that the package is going to make for us is a specific algorithm by which it will be integrating this problem. Uh, the good thing is that these decisions are transparent. The package is going to tell you what it's doing and even if you were not to, you can go and check the uh, documentation and read what the defaults are going to be and how it's, it's making the decision. So what is the solution to this problem? Well, the solution to this problem is to solve it, uh, preferably with the right variable name. So let's solve the problem. It's going to take a little while. Um, because I think that the first time I'm running that today, so it's pre-compiling everything. But then it's going to be very, very fast. So, if you know what you're doing, I say you know that you, or you want to reproduce the work of other people, and so you have a very specific series of decisions that you want to take, you could add some arguments to solve to specify a solver. You could add some arguments to solve to specify a lot of other things. Solve as a vast documentation that is explaining the number of solution of uh, arguments that you can use. I thought it's a good idea to go and check what you can actually uh, change in that. So we get our results and let's let's have a look. So it's, it's telling us that um, we have 53 different time steps that go from 0 to 40. And you'll notice that they are not spread evenly. Right? Something that we discussed last week. Uh, there are the points where the algorithm that is used for numerical integration has returned something. That's not necessarily the point that we care about, so we will we'll specify this constraint in a moment. But for now, we're just going to assume that it's, um, that it's fine. Let's do a quick plot of the solution. <coughs> Just to check that our initial uh, instinct is right. Our initial instinct is that because the, the flux of population is going from susceptible to infectious, we should end up with a population that is entirely infectious by the end of the process. 
So by time 40, whatever 40 means, we should have close to 100% uh, infectious, infectious individuals. And so no one is going to be susceptible anymore. So, okay, that's cool. It doesn't even need 40 uh, time steps to do that. It is going to require a lot fewer than that. So we're going to do zero to two. Yeah, okay. So here's what we get here. What we get is an initial population size that is uh, close to zero for the infected individual. By the way, you can also see that uh, the plot is using the right variable names that we specified. I know it's a detail, but I just think it's lovely. Um, and, and so the number of infectious individual is increasing over time. And by the end of the simulation, it is going to be 100% of the population. We can actually check that, what if we do, uh, I think it's last. So the last um, population density, uh, population size, at the end of the simulation is one to the minus nine susceptible individual and, uh, and close to a thousand uh, infectious individual. That should not seem right. Um, that's something that we'll, we'll get to address in a minute, but uh, not in a minute, in the second part of this class, actually. But um, what we are representing here, the biological quantity of interest, is individuals. And individuals tend to be, uh, in nature, overwhelmingly singular entities. So it's not like there's no 1.5 individual. There's no such thing as that. It can be one or it can be two. So there's also no such thing as one to the one uh, to the minus nine individual. That should obviously be zero. The reason for that is that what we we're solving a, a mathematics problem, and so there is no uh, there is currently no in our code as it is written specification of the fact that we should be uh, keeping the solution an integer, right? So it's describing the global like time course of the epidemics, which is fine, it looks like it should, but it's considering that the number of individuals that we put in are going to be just th this quantity, and it can go from zero to a thousand. Um, and so that is the reason for which we, um, we see a non-integer number of individuals. There is a way of, of solving that, there's a way of doing so much more, we're going to do that in a minute. Uh, but don't, don't be, um, you'll be right to be alarmed that it's not an integer number because we would like it to be an integer number, but also it's sort of to be expected because we are solving that as a mathematical problem and not as a uh, biological problem for the moment. Okay, so um, let's try to, let, let's try something a little bit different, right? Because we have a model and the first thing we should do with the model um, it's always the same, is what if we play with the variables a little bit? What if we play with the parameters a little bit? So the variables that we have here are um, s and i, but we know that the sum of s and i is going to be n, which is going to be a thousand, or something different, right? Uh, and so if we know n and s, we know i. So what we can do is say, well, n is equal to a thousand, and we call that i, uh, i note, is going to be one individual. And so it's going to be n minus i, and then i. We are just going to run this again and make sure that there is no uh, change. Yep, that's good. As you can see, it is instantaneous. We can actually time it if we want. Running that is uh, is taking about seven uh, to the minus four seconds, which is really fast. Um, that's also not a difficult problem to solve, but it's just like you could do a lot of simulation within one second if you wanted to do that. Okay, so. The second thing that we can change is also the parameters of the model. So we've said P is uh, 2%. What if P is two out of every thousand? Right, let's, let's do something 
no, uh, something a little less extreme. Let's do p is 1%. We're going to solve the problem again. And what we're going to compare here is what is happening to uh, what is happening to the number of infectious people at the end of the simulation? Is it still 100%? But also, when is the point, how oh, is this point here, the point of uh, intersection going to move? Is it going to move left? Is it going to move right? Is the epidemics progressing faster or, uh, or slower? So when we plot that, right, what we've done is that we said, instead of each contact, each reaction, having a rate of 2%, it has a rate of 1%. And what we observe is that this uh, point of inflection is moving further away to the right. So you should be noticing something here, something, something interesting, which is the fact that the, um, the rate of growth for the infectious people here, it looks suspiciously like what we would get in a logistic model. It in fact looks suspiciously like if the carrying capacity of a logistic model was uh, n, and, and and probably, you know, the growth rate is, is something that is related to um, P. There's a lot of, I'm going to send you uh, at the end of this class a, uh, a, a, a paper that uses a technique that is called uh, implicit differentiation to show that you can collapse this model to a single variable one, and that's really neat and also um, good to read with some uh, ibuprofen for the first time but it's something I can, like, whenever you see a model that looks like another model, there's probably a way to bring it back to this other model that you know. It just so happens to be the case with this one. Uh, we won't go through the, uh, oh, it's done. So what if we change the model some more? What if instead of uh, being 1%, it's 5 out of every 1,000? All the epidemics, it's still progressing, but it's progressing at a rate that is much slower. And by two time points, we don't reach equilibrium. So let's do, uh, let's give us 10 time points. And we are going to say it's one out of every thousand. Um, it doesn't change. It doesn't change just because I've um, decreased the rate of infection by a factor that is the same than the uh, time I need to add. So let's do 20. Okay. So when the rate of infection drops to one out of every thousand, it takes more time. What if we say one out of every 10,000? Let's add some more time. We want to make sure that if there is something to catch, we catch it. And there is still the same result. So that makes sense. That shouldn't be unexpected. And it shouldn't be unexpected because the way we wrote the model, the only thing that individual can do when they are susceptible is become infectious. The rate is really small. So it's currently one uh, out of every 10,000, which means that to convert your first individual that is susceptible into an infectious one, you need 10,000 contacts. That's the expected number. Um, it's still going to happen. It's going to take a while. It's going to take possibly a lot of time, but it is still going to happen. And then you increase the number of people that are infectious. And so uh, the, the number of contact that are going to be met is going to increase. The rate of success within each of these contact is going to remain the same, which is the value of P, but the number of contact is going to get larger and larger. And when the number of contact gets larger, it's also going to uh, convert more susceptible individual into infectious, which still accelerates the rate of contact. That is why we see this exponential growth of infectious uh, individuals. After some point, this is going to change. It's going to decrease the, the rate at which susceptible individuals are going to be converted into infectious individual is going to decrease. And the reason is that if you uh, pick two individuals at random, you, have, you start to have a higher chance of picking individuals that are infectious already. And so when two individuals that are already infectious meet, nothing happens. It's not something that we have in the model. It is, um, it is, it is not something that has any consequence for the 
uh, for the, the dynamics of the disease. So what we see is a slowing down of the infection process. What the strength of infection is doing is moving the point at which uh, we reach the maximum um, number of new infected cases left, so towards the beginning of the epidemics when it's really high, uh, or right towards the end uh, when it gets really slow. It's just like how long does it take for the process of converting this entire susceptible population into an entire infectious population to be complete. Uh, I can take a, a very short amount of time if it's extremely infectious, or I can take a very long time if it's not very, if the, the transmission is, uh, is very difficult. Another thing you can do is say, well, we've, we've made this assumption that there is a single individual that is uh, infectious at the beginning. What if there's five? We can run the same simulation again. And what happens when we have five individual is that we are moving the uh, curve to the left. We're sort of accelerating the process because we're starting with more infectious individuals. So we are starting with more potential contacts, and so we are starting with a higher rate of infection uh, in, the, uh, in the population. What if we have 10 individuals that are infectious at the beginning? Or if we have 10 individuals that are infectious at the beginning, we're still moving that closer to uh, the beginning. We're accelerating the epidemics. If we have 100, we should see uh, a very fast uh, decrease in the number of susceptible individuals. So that sort of makes sense, right? We've, we've built a simple model and we have checked two things. Thing number one is if we have a population in which the, uh, sorry, if we have a disease that is very transmissible, uh, beta is high, it's a very high value. It's like 2% instead of one out of every 10,000. The epidemic is going to be really, it's going to go really fast. Um, if we have a transmissibility that is low, then the epidemic is going to be very, uh, very slow. If we have an initial number of people that are infected, that is very high, it's also going to, uh, to go faster. It's going to go faster because we start higher in the curve. Like we, we sort of start ahead in the epidemic process. It's not changing the actual um, growth rate, maximum growth rate. If we have a number of initially infectious people that is slow, then it is, uh, that is low, it is going to take a little bit more time to reach the point that uh, was the, the process is, is completed. Models of epidemics uh, have a very undesirable property, which is that they are extremely sensitive to initial conditions. We'll get to that with another model. This one does not show that, but there are some models where depending on the initial condition, the behavior is going to change. Another model that we've discussed that has a, um, this sort of behavior is the LA effect model, the LA Bowen effect, where if you start below the threshold for growth rates, your model is going to, uh, your population is going to die out. If you start above the threshold for positive growth rate, we are uh, going to see an increase in the population size. Uh, message in the um, message in the chat that says malformed reaction if you try to use SI. So um, could you just copy and paste your, uh, your definition of SI and then we'll see what, uh, what's wrong with it. So there's a couple of different ways you could, uh, you could actually specify your reaction. I've used the um, uh, right arrow symbol, which is, uh, which is the thing you can do. You can also use like, uh, dash and then greater than, um, mm, 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 mm. yeah, I'm just, I'm just reading the, uh, version this, like, it seems to be, it seems to be correct. And that is, uh, that is exactly the same one that I have. Mm, okay, that's well. Uh, we'll we'll take some time after the class on uh, on Teams to uh, to catch up on that. 
Um, okay, so what is, uh, what's next with this model after the break? So we have a model that is very simple, which is a, um, it's a good thing, but we want to explore behaviors that are a little bit more uh, interesting. So after the class, what we'll, s what we'll do is uh, start to add compartments. So which is to say we are going to start adding some um, biological processes to infection. We're going to make the model a little bit more complex. We're just going to, um, you'll see, it, we're just going to build this thing like piece by piece, like it's a, a Lego set. Uh, when this is done and we get a sense for what is the behavior of these other models with additional um, choices that we've made to represent the infection process, we are going to solve this little issue that we have, I don't know about you, but I do have it, where's the number of individuals? It should always be a number of individuals. And so we are going to uh, specify parameters for the simulation that are going to respect this constraint. So we're going to have something that is inching a little bit more towards some uh, degree of biological realism. So we are going to take a 15 minute breaks. It's, uh, it's five to 10, so we are going to start at 10.10. Um, and we will add some more compartment to this model and make it a little bit more complex. I'll see you in 15 minutes.